Welcome to another Duke Audio phone chat. Today's phone chat will be with Richard Jaffe. Uh, you'll hear about him in just a second. I'm DC, the Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, and I'm here with Dogat Bandita and Feline Guchita, but without dear, lovely Katrinka, who's stranded in America. Uh, but we'll be back at some point. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable and can get out and do whatever you want within the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So in just a minute, we're going to um, call up Richard Jaffe, who's a Buddhist scholar, focusing on Soto Zen, uh, or I think it's more correct to say just Zen, or actually probably just Japanese Buddhism, clerical marriage in Japan, D.T. Suzuki, and uh, a lot more. But you'll hear, you'll hear. Right after we pause to meditate, Of course, you don't have to meditate. You cannot meditate. So, listen. When you hear the bell, hit pause and either meditate or don't meditate. And then when you're through meditating or not meditating, hit pause. No, hit unpause. And then we'll hit the bell to end the meditation or non-meditation. So let's call him up right now, okay? Hello? Richard Jaffe. Hi. Hey, how are you? David Janwick, yes. Good, good. Finally got you. Great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are things in Bali? Um, well, they're, you know, they're very quiet. There haven't been any tourists here in a couple of months. Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody's got to wear a face mask and the beaches are closed. And there's not huh. much, there's not much virus. I've noticed it picking up a little uh, just in this last week. Uh, there were, uh -huh. a, there were a hundred more. People, it seems to me like it grew by about a hundred in a week, and that's really the first. Uh, that's the biggest movement I've seen, and there's been five people die, so not much happening. Huh. Uh, but just waiting for the storm, really. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it kind of explodes because it increases exponentially. You know, it seems like there isn't much, and then all of a sudden, wham. So, how's Elaine? She's well. She yeah. is uh, upstairs working away. She's uh -huh. up working from home. Uh, I'm on leave until January, and I'm working on the DT Suzuki book. Um, so, I'm doing starting on that project. And uh, our daughter, Zena, is down in... Uh, New Orleans, and she's moving to California. She's a surgical nurse. Oh. So, 
she'd been sort of on the front lines of this whole thing. Wow. Uh, yeah. She and her, her boyfriend partner is a emergency medicine doctor. So they both have been kind of in the thick of it, but we're, we're well, you know, it's strange being, I wasn't able to go to Japan this spring. Uh, just kind of sitting around here in North Carolina. It's a little odd, but uh-huh. uh, we're pretty fortunate all in all that we can both, you know, do our work from here and nobody's gotten sick that we know immediately. And so that's helped. Uh, I mean, that's good, but yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, we're living through this unbelievable event, you know, it's cataclysmic event, like, the Great Depression or one of the world wars or something. I mean, this really is a huge thing that's going on. Yeah, it's so, multiple huge things going on. Yeah. yeah. So, I saw the Japanese translation of uh, Crooked Cucumber when I was in Japan in December. Yeah. And I bought, a couple, I bought a couple of copies and gave it to some of my Japanese friends. Yeah. Buddhist priest, and uh, you know I know Ishii Seijun pretty well. He did the introduction to oh, the right, Japanese translation. Right. See, I don't, I don't, I don't know who he is, and uh, 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 I, I was involved in it, in in uh, you know not in translating, but in uh, you know they were in touch with me a lot. I got him to do it too. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, but. But um, I've asked um, translator. I know if he would translate that for me. A very good mm. translator who helped me, uh, Fred Herman, uh, and Hoitsu's introduction. I wanted those two things out of it. Mm-hmm. So I want to hear more about the Suzuki book. Uh, I mean the mm. D- yeah, well, it's a, the DT Suzuki book, and uh, about your work with them and about your education and, uh, you know, just give us a, a, a quick bio and then what you're doing. I want to hear. Okay. So, as you know, I uh, ended up at the Zen Center starting in 1976. Good. And, uh, good place to start. Uh, yeah. San Francisco, uh, a good place to start. Having dropped out of the University of Michigan and drifted around and I lived in a community in New York called the Lindisfarne Association. Oh, like yeah. The Lindisfarne. I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I met uh, there Reb, Dan Welch, Rusa, uh, Dan's first wife, Louise, and uh, Richard Baker, and decided to move from there to San Francisco. So I ended up moving to San Francisco and... Uh, finished my BA out at San Francisco State, and when that was done, spent about six years at the Zen Center and a three, couple of years at Tassajara, two and a half, three years. Question. Then went back. Question. Yes. You're, you're, can you say specifically what your degree was in? Ah. My degree at SF State was in philosophy and religious studies. Mm-hmm. And my advisor was a guy named uh, Jacob Needleman. Oh my God! Yeah, book, <laughs> really. <New Berlin. laughs> yeah, you know Jacob. Oh yeah. I he, mean, I used to long yeah. ago. He was the a professor of religious studies and philosophy. Huh. But yeah, uh, neat. he was also the head, one of the top people in the Gurdjieff works in the Bay Area, and still is, as far as I know. Uh-huh. Uh so anyway, um, I ended up at the Zen Center and practiced quite vigorously uh, until 1985 or so. And then Elaine uh, and I decided to sort of leave, move back east. And I got into graduate school at Yale and did a Ph.D. in Buddhist studies with a guy named Stanley Weinstein, uh-huh. who is a alumnus, or was, he passed away uh, two years ago now. I think it was about two years ago. He was an alumnus of Komazawa University, his, his alma mater. Wow. Komazawa University. 
Wow. He went there on the GI Bill after uh, the Korean War, having taught himself as a Jewish kid growing up in Brooklyn, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Uh, wow. And so Stan mentor at Yale, and it took me about a decade to get my Ph.D., including three years living in Japan and following in Stan's footsteps and Suzuki Roshi's. Uh, I ended up uh, as a research fellow at Komazawa University for three years, working wow. with a wonderful, wonderful Sotoshu cleric scholar named Ishikawa Rikizan, huh. who unfortunately he died at the age of 55 mm. uh, a number of years ago. But he was a fantastic mentor for me. And I did my first book, as you know, on clerical marriage in Japan, right. when the abandonment of celibacy inspired, to a large extent, the sort of the catalyst for that was the uh, beginning of, I think it's the last section of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, where or it's maybe one of the last chapters where Shunryu Suzuki Roshi says, uh, you here in America are neither monk nor layman. But the fact that you're uh, not exact that you're not monks may not be that difficult, but the fact that you're not exactly layman may pose some difficulty for you. Something along those lines, if I remember right. correctly. Right. Yeah. And uh, I started digging around when I was in Japan, looking at how it came about that all the priests ended up, 90% of them anyway, being married. And I was asking questions and... Uh, it became clear to me that very few people really had an answer as to when it came about exactly and when people were allowed to marry uh, technically within the Soto school and so on. So I made that the focus of my uh, dissertation, which became my first book, which was published uh, in 2000. Yeah, I want you to go back to that at some point. Yeah. And get into, okay. into that, all right? So after finishing my degree, at Ph.D., I ended up at uh, North Carolina State University in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, taught there for six years, finished my first book, and then was offered a position at Duke. And I moved to Duke University in 2001, and I am now a full professor there in the Department of Religious Studies and the director of the Center for East Asian Studies, the Asian Pacific Studies Institute at Duke. Uh, and so I spend a lot of time working on Buddhism still, thinking about East Asia, working on East Asia, and have continued to work on various topics related to Buddhism in Asia. My second book came out in the 2019 in May, and that is a study of the uh, contact between Japanese Buddhists who travel to India, Southeast Asia, Tibet in the late 19th, early 20th century, and sort of the way in which those travels transformed their thinking about Japanese Buddhism. And that book called Seeking Shakyamuni, mm. uh, South, mm -hmm. Asia, South Asia and the Creation of Modern Japanese Buddhism, uh, it came out from... Uh, University of Chicago Press, and I'm now moving on to another project I've been working on for quite some time, which is a series of publications about the other Suzuki, Suzuki Daisets, as Houston Smith wrote in the foreword to or preface to Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. There were two Suzukis, uh, and uh, I'm working on a biography of D.T. Suzuki, but in the meantime, along the way, I've published uh, as general editor four volume selected works of D.T. Suzuki. And I'm now editing uh, for Columbia University Press the lectures that uh, sort of the, uh, what should I say, rewritten lectures that he, that Suzuki Daisef, D.T. Suzuki gave at Columbia University in. 1952-53, and these are the famous seminars that people like John Cage and Eric Fromm and Karen Horney, perhaps J.D. Salinger, 
And then a little bit later on in the later 50s, 53, 54, 55, 56, artists like Agnes Martin, Leonora Carrington, uh, and uh, some of the beat poets, perhaps, uh, attended and sort of shook up the intellectual scene among avant-garde writers and artists in New York in the 50s. So I'm editing those lectures. I have a, a manuscript of the lectures. It was never published by during uh, Di Setz's lifetime. But I managed to get a hold of a copy of the manuscript, and I'm editing those and writing an introduction about that intellectual and spiritual moment in global history when, when uh, Di Setz Suzuki came to, back to New York and spent uh, the period from around 51 to 57 living in New York City and largely teaching at Columbia and lecturing around the United States. So that's what I'm up to these days. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, and I would hear about his, about him uh, there at that time from Elsie Mitchell because he mm. and, what's his name? He's Samatsu. Uh, they were right. They were both on the board of uh, the Cambridge Buddhist Association, I think it is. Yes, uh, you're right. They, they both went up there, I think it was in the summer of 57, perhaps, somewhere in that time period. He and Hisamatsu went up there, and I think Hisamatsu had an appointment at Harvard, and uh, they led a series of, gave a series of talks at the Cambridge Buddhist Association with L.C. Mitchell, some mm -hmm. of which, the tapes of some of those talks we now have at Duke. Oh, uh, good. We acquired them good. from the Cambridge Association, and the old reel-to-reel -reel tapes, Duke Special Collections uh, uh, restored as uh, digital in digital format. So those talks, some of which are by Hisamatsu, translated by, it may have been Suzuki who did the translation or interpretation, I'm not sure. Anyway, we have those. And, and incidentally, um, kind of drifting here a little bit, but <laughs> we also, we at, at Duke now, we have the archives of the Rochester Zen Center and the papers of Philip Kaplow Roshi. Huh. Uh, those are now, there's a finding aid and his letters and everything. The Rochester Zen Center very generously gave those to Duke uh, through a student of mine, a PhD student of mine who just finished, who was a student at the Rochester Zen Center. She helped broker the deal and Tom Roberts and Bodine Kolja uh -huh. and the other board uh -huh. gave those papers to Duke. So those are available for anyone interested in the history of American Buddhism we have those papers from most of them are from 1966 or so, 65 on. But it's a really invaluable record of material, uh, record of the history of, of Zen in America. Uh, and Kaplow was incredibly influential in bringing a lot of people, both uh, like me and Elaine, uh, who did introductory workshops with Kaplow. And that's what got us interested in Zen, in fact. So hmm. anyway, a little side there. No, no, no. That's nothing. I mean, I'm just. I I'm a tangent talker. I go way further than you do. You're you're very focused. <laughs> uh, that's really interesting. Uh, Tom Roberts. Uh, he's the lawyer, right? Right. Yeah, yep. he's he's a close friend of Steve Tipton's. Intellectual property lawyer. He gave me some advice once through Steve. That's uh, right. Yes. Who, right. Who, pardon? Rebecca Wilson, the student who worked with me and just finished her PhD. Mm -hmm. Steve Tipton recommended she contact me about coming to Duke and doing her PhD. Ah. So, yeah, if you know a lot of people, David. <laughs> I don't know Tom Roberts. I know Steve very well. We're very close. Yeah. And I'll be talking to him yeah. so soon. Yeah. yeah. He's an interesting guy. And, and uh, he was there in that formative period of 
San Francisco Zen Center. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and what a yeah. keen eye, what a keen eye he has. Good lord. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, he and Nils and I used to get together every year. Mm. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. So uh, keep going. All right. So, well, that's it. That's my biography. So I'm I'm <laughs> up to autobiography now. Okay. Well, that's that's great. I'm All right. Leave. Well, I can I can I can direct you. Uh, All right. Yeah. Direct me. You tell me what you want me to talk about. Well. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, more specifically about uh, the, uh, you know, the information from your first book, uh, because mm. I'm reading Crooked Cucumber uh, podcasts, and I'm I'm, uh -huh. I'm posting one a week, and uh, uh -huh. I'm, do, I'm doing phone chats too, and uh, uh -huh. I'm doing them separate because. Uh, that you know they're they're long, uh, so I do the yeah. I do the podcast the reading the chapter with comments, and I just put up chapter mm. seven, which is called the occupation, and uh, huh. uh, it was not a real long chapter, but it was like an hour and five minutes, uh, and then the, the my comments <laughs> when I was talking about doing tangents, yeah, I go all over the place, uh, it's like an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, you know, I've thought about you. I started thinking about you just right away, really, in the, you know, because, uh, say, uh, Shunyu Suzuki's uh, uh, father was a married priest who, who uh, I... married uh, and whose wife lived in the temple, you know, before the Soto Shu uh, had... Uh, really approved of that. And uh, then uh, uh, Son, his, his master, Gyozhi and Son, wasn't married, but he had a lover uh, mm. that, that uh, uh, they called the Daikoku-sama. The, the Daikoku uh -huh. is, the, you know, the, the god of the, uh, the kitchen. And um, right. so women that lived with priests were called Daikoku-sama back then. And she followed him mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, Rinsoin after her husband died. She was married, and uh, but was lovers with him while she was married. <laughs> and he was like very strict, very super strict, you know, like a mean teacher, yeah. right? And then uh, you know when uh, Suzuki Roshi would go back to Japan, he would go visit her. Uh, her, I never know what word to use. Her ashes site. I mean, uh -huh. can I Her say grave? grave? Yeah. What do you say in English? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, so she was an important person to him. She was a little nicer to him, but not a lot. And so on. But but anyway, so uh, his his two teachers, uh, well, Kishizawa, so his father yeah. and uh, so on, like, that were, were both married as far as he was concerned. Kishizawa wasn't. But uh, he used that as sort of an excuse to get married himself. And he had three marriages. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, tell us about S Soto, well, not just Soto, Zen, Buddhist priests in uh, Japan getting married, how that came about. Uh, mm. And, uh, you know, anything you want to say, whatever is interesting, whatever, you know, you want. So, you know, what year was the Shunryu born? 1904. Okay. So, uh, you know, initially in 1872, the government had decriminalized the marriage of uh, clerics. Up until that point, it was illegal, according to state law or huh. the law. Tokugawa authorities and the domainal authorities also in many domains and clerics who, although it was, you know, a lot of them, like you're saying about uh, so on, uh, Suzuki Roshi's teacher had lovers or covert marriages. Sporadically, the authorities, when they decided to crack down for whatever reason, 
they didn't like the priest or whatever reason. It, it was punishable by, you know, rather severe uh, uh, penalties, exile or even death if you were caught fornicating, technically. Uh -huh. But it was very, very rare to enforce that kind of thing. And in 1872, as a way of part of the move to modernize Japan, the government, the Meiji government uh, authorities, decriminalized clerical marriage and meat eating and wearing of ordinary civilian clothing and growing out your hair if you were a cleric. Oh, well, that's very interesting. And, I didn't know all the, those details. Yeah, yeah. And, and so basically what the government was saying was this is not our business. And there was a some turmoil about whether they were forcing people to marry. Yes. But at the end of the day, what was yes. the, what, how it broke out was each individual denomination or school could enforce its sex law as they saw fit. So if the Soto school didn't want priests to marry, they could say priests shouldn't marry. And indeed, the Soto Shu did say that up until around 19... I forget the exact date, 1910, something like that. Mm -hmm. So at that point, there actually was a sex law saying that women were not to be allowed, in wives were not to be allowed in temples, priests were not to marry, et cetera, et cetera. And some great priest like Nishiari Boksan, who's uh -huh. a very famous comic oh, yeah. on Shobogen, wrote vehement tracts opposing clerical marriage and meat eating and abandonment of tonsure and so on by the Soto uh, clergy, uh, saying this was not. So, you know, one of the things that struck me as I was working on the book was that passage from Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, Suzuki Roshi talking, he really was talking about himself as well, in that it has never been easy, I think, for Japanese clerics, and that's the term I tend to use, cleric, as opposed to priest or monk, because they're neither monks nor laymen. That's a good word. This, that's a good word, yeah. This liminal position. They marry, and they uh, oftentimes, they don't like to, my friends, the people I know best, they'll eat a little bit of meat and fish and so on in the temple, but they don't particularly do a lot of that. I remember one time I brought as a gift... <laughs> <laughs> to a temple friend, beef jerky and whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, you know, I appreciate the sentiment and the gift, but this is a temple. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, so, <laughs> but Richard, Richard, oh. <laughs> you, would, you were more likely than not to have, it for it to have been appropriate from what I've experienced. Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, we ate that stuff and drank quite a bit. But to bring it as an omiyage was a bridge too far for him. And to do it in tandem <laughs> uh -huh. was sort of like <laughs> throwing everything out the window. So he, yeah. he uh, made some, you know, and a, a, a subtle comment like that from a Japanese person is about as blunt as you're going to get, like that's a hammer right. on the head. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. After I changed my gift-giving practices a little bit. But anyway. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh, uh-huh. One of the things, uh, I, I actually, uh, in February, did a workshop out at University of Southern California. Duncan Williams brought me out with uh, Ann Gleig and Wansu Kim, two colleagues of mine. Uh, Ann Gleig has written a wonderful book, American Dharma, and Wansu Kim uh, has uh, written the book, Empire of the Dharma. He works on Korea, and we were asked to talk, do a workshop, uh, neither monk nor layman. Uh, and so I revisited some of what's been going on. And in looking at more recent material, my book was published in 2001. I have to say, to a large extent, not much has changed in uh, Japanese uh, Buddhism. In terms of the Japanese clergy still idealize monasticism and clerical celibacy and sort of the life of the patriarchs, the great Zen patriarchs, who, yeah. all of whom supposedly were monks and unmarried. Yeah. But 
they live a very different kind of life, many of these priests in their home temple. There are exceptions. The priest uh, Tanaka Shinkai, I believe is his name, out at Hokkyoji, where Katagiri Roshi trained, is one of the unmarried Soto priests. And there have been some of them who are quite strict. But for the most part, Soto clergy, 90% or so, are married and have children and pass on the temple, if they can, to uh, someone in their family. And it's becoming increasingly difficult, but they try to do that. So there's this sort of wrestling, this idealization of a monastic life and an aspiration towards that kind of life. But at the same time... Uh, a practical existence that is at variance with it. And so a lot of Soto clerics live in this space in between, this kind of gray area. Um, and I think the younger generation, this may be beginning to change, although not too long ago I had an interesting experience. I was out at a sushi restaurant with a priest, and his son showed up, uh, who's married, his son is married, he's uh, going to take over the temple one of these days. And my friend got very angry with the son, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, and later on, it was explained to me by the son, he showed up wearing his wedding ring. And the father was mad that he was wearing the wedding ring. He said, priests shouldn't be wearing wedding rings. Uh, so, uh. it's okay to marry, but you don't want to flash around that you're married. And Again, uh -huh. sort of drift, or sort of uh, moving from association to association. This is why, you know, you mentioned the women sometimes are called Dai Koksan or Oksan, you know, the woman at the back of the room, but in the right. back room. Right. right. I don't know about Oksan, but a lot of wives of clerics, in front of others anyway, refer to their husband as Hojo-san. Oh, as she always did. Yeah, because you don't want to call him, you know, by his first name or be too familiar. Now, there's a certain amount of just Japanese cultural practice there. In a family, people will refer to the dad, the mother will refer to the dad as Otosan, rather than by his given name right. oftentimes. Right. I, but, I'm, I'm not sure if what she called him, you know, I'm thinking of her talking about him, but... Yeah. I can I can remember her calling him Hojo San around me, yeah. but that's right. Particularly in public, if you're in a private setting, a lot of times then the wife will use, you know, the person's name, uh, you know, uh, Ichiro San or whatever his Buddhist uh, yeah. name might be, uh, Zendo San. But around the parishioners, in a public setting, more often than not, they will say, "Oh, go ask Hojo San." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this yeah. is a way of, again, it, it is a bit of a smokescreen about the fact that you're dealing with someone who's married. On the other hand, <laughs> the parishioners at a lot of local temples want to have a married priest there. It's more stable, it's safer than having a single man in the community. Uh, and they want the son of the current priest, the incumbent, if they like the incumbent, they want there to be an heir who can take over the temple and continue it. And they're yeah. quite thrilled about that. Um, uh, so it's both sides. The parishioners expect this and want this to some degree. And the clergy want to live this way. But at the same time, the whole structure and sort of um, philosophy and history of practice, at least superficially of Zen, is one of celibate monasticism and the kind of hard monastic practice. Yeah. And that continues to be the ideal. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a comment here. Um, of course. Um, now, now, Suzuki and Mitsu never lived together in Japan. They, uh -huh. they, they married right before he came to America. Mm. And the reason they married is that... Uh, uh, so Koji had requested a married priest because uh -huh. um, uh, what's his name? Uh, ta, 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 uh, the one beforehand, oh, God, 
mm. slips my mind right now. Hodo Tabase um, had, you know, uh, had some lever. I think he might have had a Daikoku because there was a, there was a nun there. Mm. Uh, uh-huh. uh, but uh, but so <laughs> Suzuki filled out that he was married, <laughs> and when he wrote mm. it, and then uh. he. He talked to his mother-in-law. He said, "I got to get married <laughs> because they want to marry priests." And he said, "Who should I marry?" And she said, "Well, Mitsu, of course." Um, <laughs> he went, "Oh yeah, of course." Anyway, that's sort of the way I heard it. And then huh. she was told, and she said, "Well, you know, it's just like she had no choice about it." Well, of course, I have to do it if he wants to. Yeah, uh, and- I've always suspected they were lovers. Because they knew each mm. other very well, but you know, no way to know. Uh, yeah, I know it makes uh, sense, and I think, particularly in the United States, which is, you know, for all intents and purposes, n- a non-monastic kind of culture. You know, yes. you do have families and priests going off to join the clergy, and that was considered an honorable thing in the 20th century for one son in a Catholic family to do. But for the most part. This is not a culture that valorizes celibacy and uh, monasticism. And so Japanese clergy here, uh, I think, would be much more open about that. And again, there's the stability factor and not having a lecherous uh, single man in the temple sort of hitting on uh, parishioners' daughters and so on. So Right. Well, here, though... That, here though, uh, it's 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 so much. There's so much more temptation than there. There's not the cultural, all the cultural structure around it to protect them if they have some particular commitment. And also, Japanese will let a lot slide by. You know, if it's done discreetly, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, these priests came to America and they had they had something happened that I do not think happened. It, 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 it all the same way in Japan. They had women coming on to them, and yeah. uh, and uh, you know some of them uh, just lost control. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you know I, I have wrestled with. Uh, so you know, one one thing I thought a lot about, and I I sort of looked into when. Uh, I was doing this workshop out at USC in February and trying to update myself about what's going on in the Soto Shu. The precepts that are taken during ordination still say, as best as I can tell, that uh, the third precept, I believe it is, that one should not have sex. You should not have sexual relations. We've translated that, and the latest translation, the official Soto translation, of the ritual manual, the Gyoji Kihan, mm-hmm. that came out, published in Japan, has in English the third precept is not to misuse the senses, right. which is a Zen sense, the American kind of thing. Right. But the Japanese, the Sino Japanese says no sexual relations still. And when people are ordained in Japan, it says fuin. Fuin is no sex. The lay precept, which is similar, is fujain. That's not misusing the senses. That's not being licentious or promiscuous, fujayi. And so we in the United States are sort of taking the lay third precept, even the priests who are getting ordained, the clerics who are getting ordained here. In Japan, they use a different precept that says no sex. Ja means sort of bent or, or crooked or heterodox, or jayin is, is licentiousness. And for uh-huh. lay people who depend precepts, when you get a lay ordination, you commit to not being sexually promiscuous, whatever that might mean. It means in Japan, maybe you don't have five mistresses and a wife, you only have two. <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> you know, it's open interpretation, right? Uh, yeah. This notion of what promiscuous is. But that's the precept we use. And interestingly to me, as a scholar, the English translation, the official English translation of the Japanese uses the not misusing the senses. It doesn't translate directly what they say in Japan. So 
it really diverges from the official version version in Japan, as far as I I can tell. The ritual uh-huh. manual. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. Yeah. Which is circulating now. You know, the Soto School is translating the whole... They have an official Shobo Genzo translation project that's just about done. And they did the ritual manual, the Gyoji Kihan, which they've circulated in the United States. And um, there's a couple other texts that, that they've done. Kazan's text, uh, the Dento Kodoku, as well, has been translated. So, um, mm. anyway, yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, I want to briefly mention uh, three priests uh, uh-huh. that, that I've, uh, well, um, you know, my feeling about Suzuki is he wanted his priests to get married if they weren't, you know, he told me, he told me he wanted me not to have a girlfriend for five years. And I just told him, forget it. I've got a girlfriend now. And we're sleeping together right here at Tassahara. And he went, never mind. Don't, I don't want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> and uh, so look, how open is that, you know? And he told other people to get married. Sometimes, mm. I think, too quickly, like with Ed and yeah. Meg. Uh, yeah. You know, really. Uh, but, you know, what, what he, 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 he didn't want them playing around. He felt like if they get married, you know, he th- I think he thought it would be best not to for have a, a period, like he told me. Uh, mm. But if they're just going to be screwing around, better just to get married. Uh, now, yeah, I, Sh- Sh- Shoto Harada... You know, at uh, mm. Sogenji, he was selling, uh-huh. and uh-huh. he's in he's in the uh, you know the David, Mumon Yamada line. Yeah, David, I I again like my use of the word cleric instead of monk or priest. Yeah, I I talk about people being unmarried rather than celibate because you never know. <laughs> oh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, I so think he's unmarried. I think you're. I think unmarried is a very good term. Uh, that's yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. but, uh, I really, I really don't think, you know, uh, I was around him a lot and yeah, yeah I think there were some close calls, but he was uh-huh. surrounded by his students and yeah. he didn't play around, you know, uh-huh. he didn't drink. If, if somebody gave him a bottle of booze, he'd give it to me. Uh, uh-huh. and, or oh, they could, they could drink on like New Year's Eve a couple of times, you know, and that was neat. Yeah. Uh, but um, he had, he was a true Hojo son. I mean, he had a small, that's a, uh, uh, it means a, like a, an area, right? In, right, the 10 foot square hut is one way it was translated. Right, right. I think 10 yeah. feet is a little short. It's got to be a little more yeah. than that, but maybe. Uh-huh. The abbot, right? The Hojo, yeah. Right, right. Well, he did have a small area, and it was just right in the center of the temple, and it was just two rooms. And they weren't real big, mm. and they were full of stuff, you know, full of books and stuff. He was very diligent. Yeah. Uh, but so ah. I've I've seen uh, diligent. Uh, uh, oh God, is my dog out there? Diligent uh, priests, and I've seen uh, I've seen very indulgent priests, and I've known gay priests, and you know all uh-huh. sorts of things. Yeah. So I should say, I'm talking about Japanese clerics here. <laughs> and of course, it's true of American clerics. <laughs> you know, uh, to some degree, Reb Tension has t- tried to institute this five-year period for people he ordains, where they stay at Green Gulch, and I think they're supposed to be single during that period if they're not in a relationship. Uh, and stay in residence for five years with him, I think. Um, something like that. He's been trying to do what Suzuki Roshi was trying to do, I guess. Oh, and Suzuki Roshi tried feebly. I mean, he didn't... Yeah, he just, yeah. He gave up immediately. <laughs> um, yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, I have a lot of respect for Rep. Great. I think he's, I think he's you know, he's a... Yeah totally focused person he always was what i said about rev is he's he he was an older student than me the day he arrived uh, mm-hmm. uh-huh. uh 
And, uh, you know, I mean, he was just, I just couldn't comprehend that sort of dedication or, you know. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, and and also people bond with him. He has very devoted students, and he has mm -hmm. concentrated like a Japanese priest. He is focused on practice and teaching, and he's got his own mm -hmm. way. He's he's controversial with Inzen Center and people around there, uh, but you know, to me, it's a big basket. And it takes different yeah. types, and he he covers yeah. one area very well, his area, and yeah, I have a lot of respect. Um, all right, go on, go on. This is fantastic. So I'm going to have to go in a few minutes because I have a meeting coming up. But I, I did want to say, you know, the thing about Harada. Yeah. The Rinzai School is one of the few schools in Japan, uh, denominations of Buddhism in Japan, where for the heads of training temples, the expectation is that they are unmarried. Uh -huh. and. Uh, those are going to take over the big training temples like Myoshinji or Tenryuji. Yeah. There yeah. are exceptions to that. Yeah, but if you I want see. to go on and be a Roshi and, and teach, get Inca and be a Roshi and take over a training temple, the expectation in Rinzai is that you are unmarried. This isn't even true of the so-called Vinaya school, the Rishu in Japan. Apparently the head of the Rishu which is all about the precepts and the regulations of monastic life. Apparently that person is married. But Rinzai is stuck to this. And again, like within Sotoshu, it's a very small number of clerics who are unmarried and honor that kind of monastic life, single monastic life, in a way that is not honored within, for, to a large extent in Soto. So, for example, Hoitsu, right, was the... Wasn't he the Godo at uh, Eheji and the Tonto? Yes. Yeah, he was Tonto and he, first he's and then married. Godo. Now he, left his, he left his wife behind, but uh, then he went off to Eheji for a number of years, and that's perfectly fine uh, within Soto to do that, even if, you know, high positions within the uh, uh, training temples or, you know, a couple of Kancho back, the head of the Soto school, Hata Egyoku was married. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, the head of the Soto school, the, the chief incumbent, the Kancho, uh, can be married in Soto. So uh, it varies quite a bit. And Rinzai has been the strictest uh, in that regard among a lot of these denominations. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say one thing about the, uh, yeah. the uh, Suzuki Roshi lecture where uh, he mentions uh, neither monk nor layman. I, I put a recording from that and read that section in the good one of my first podcasts. Uh, that was a talk he gave on November 19th, 1969, the first talk he gave in the Page Street building. And it was a brief wow. talk. It was a brief talk. It was, you know, like in huh. a ceremony. Uh, and... Um, you know, just remember well, that. that. You, you you can see it on shinyusuzuki.com, 11 I'll You know, I'll check it out, and it makes a lot of sense. How, having that context is really useful because here they are. They're moving into this residential center together, right? Yeah, yeah. And they're, it's, it's not quite a monastery, and they're not quite monks but they're living together and practicing intensively. So they're not quite layman. So that makes, you know, that, and that was the life at Zen center. And that makes a lot of sense uh, that he would give that little talk there. Interesting. I did not know that. I'll check it out, David. Yeah. So yeah. listen, I'm going to have to go because I've got to uh, uh, go. I can't go anywhere. I have a zoom meeting. <laughs> My daughter spent, uh, uh, a semester study abroad in Bali. Oh, when? Uh, uh, this would have been, um, let's see, 2011. And oh, she was up, a, up in the hills in the rice growing area of the island, living with a family. She was learning some Indonesian and uh, um, doing art projects and working with the coral reef preservation folks as well. Yeah, that's sad, sad yeah. story. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, 
environmentally mm. the is a sad story globally from uh, uh. every direction that's happening uh, uh. um uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. She was. That's two years before we arrived. We got here in 2013. Mm -hmm. I haven't been back. Uh, I don't know how. It's too expensive there, and, and I don't want to drive. It's great. Mm -hmm. We live in this mm -hmm. nice small world. I can walk places, and uh, services and stuff are just plentiful and very cheap. And tech support's yeah. great. And, uh, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Huh. But but I miss America. And I miss the wide open spaces. You know. Yeah, you know, one thing after living in Japan, uh, when I was doing my dissertation and we were there for three years, we came back for very brief visits. But when we moved back, I remember shortly after coming back to the United States, I was in New Haven and we were filling up the car with gas. And I was staying at a gas station and looking out across this vista that was just totally open. And I thought to myself, my God, this is so rare. You know, yeah. Um, I I really like Japan. Uh, Japan has a number of uh, qualities that I like better than here. Uh, one is mm. it's a great walking place. Uh, yes. And I walk around here a lot, but but Japan's just got nooks and crannies just everywhere you go. They're cool, and you can go up into all these trails and to the mountains and everywhere and. Uh, it's a great walking place. I used to bicycle a lot. I wouldn't do it now. But um, here, uh, you know, it's it, that that's different. The people here are great. I mean, I like the people in Japan, but they're pretty formal and everything. People here are just, they're sort of, they're uh, very relaxed and, you know, really nice to relate to. Uh, I love that. Mm. Uh, an Indonesian is is uh, a really nice language. Huh. Um, hmm. All right. I should well, let you go. All right, David. Yeah. I, I, and uh, well, take care. Stay safe and healthy. And and uh, if you have any follow up questions, let me know. And let's do this again. This is really a pleasure for me. So thanks. I will. One quick question. Yeah. Uh, what's Kelly up to? What's who? Kelly. Kelly is doing great. He's he's got a uh, he's got a tree trimming business. He was in the wine business for years, and he was just uh -huh. you know they wanted the biggest distributor in the country wanted him to be head of the whole East Coast West Coast. But just one day he well he didn't do it just one day he he resigned from the wine business. It was just too fast and high powered and all that. He's always been a nature boy. And you know, he's uh -huh. a mycologist. Uh, so I have a fun story. I think I may have, may have told you this about Kelly. Uh, when we were at the center, Elaine was doing childcare, uh, you know, for evening Zaza. And I guess it was or on Saturday. And uh, as a treat, she took the kids over to the greengrocer and said, you can each get one thing that you want and I'll pay for it. So she came back and she said, the strangest thing happened. Kelly went over and he took a paper bag and he filled it with raw mushrooms. Yeah. And yeah. that's what he wanted. And Elaine was so impressed with this. She came back and after Zazen or whatever it was, she said to me, you wouldn't believe what Kelly did. <laughs> and so Lo and behold, uh, he, he's been into mushrooms ever since. He must, I don't know, this would have been probably 80, 81, something like that. Couldn't have been 79 or 78? It could have been 79. That's possible. Yeah. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, I remember taking him and some other boys when they were about 12 or something to a something like a Stevie Wonder concert, you know, a big thing in the Oakland Coliseum or something. And afterwards, you know, we went to a, like a pancake place and everybody got, and Kelly got a salad. <laughs> well, listen, David, I've got to go now. It's a, a pleasure talking with you and uh, we'll do it again sometime soon. Hopefully not another 10 years or something between talks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, David. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. Well, be well.
Yeah, you too. Bye bye. <laughs>